This lesson represents a survey of application and protocol aware services and technologies. And there's probably no device more application aware than a next generation firewall. So what we see here is kind of the, the processing of an application in this diagram of a Palo Alto Networks next generation firewall, which is a great example of a device that is protocol and application aware. And not just, by the way, based on the port numbers that are being used uh, or the IP addresses, but actually fine granular control into the behavior of the application itself. So let's kind of take a look at this diagram where we see really broken down into kind of five levels of processing. And th the Palo Alto, actually is a technology called single pass processing, where it does all of this with a single pass uh, with separation of all of its planes. So there's the initial processing of the packet. And again, that's looking at the source zone, for example, the untrusted zone uh, or traffic coming from the trusted zone to the untrusted zone, IP version four and version six addressing, and even identifying a user identification, maybe based on a user who's part of Active Directory or some other e-directory, for example. Then a policy-based forward lookup will happen. Then it will be passed on to the destination zone. And then most likely some translation policy will kick in with the NAP policy. Then, notice in the second row, we've got the security pre-policy. So it can check to see if, you know, is it using allowed ports? And if it is, we'll go ahead and create a session, a TCP session, for example. The next layer, application. Is this something that's being encrypted? It must be decrypted first, okay? So if so, we'll use the decryption policy. Then there's an application override policy. What if you created a policy for something that is a custom application, maybe a custom front end to a database in your organization? So you're going to create an override. So all you're really going to do is inspect it at layer three, four. You're not going to do, do deep packet content inspection. Okay. Well, you can override with a policy there. If not, you can go ahead and do an application identification and content ID policy going all the way up into layer seven of the OSI model. Then the processing goes to the security policy, checking your security policy, any security profiles that have been applied, and then post-processing, re-encrypting the traffic, for example, to send it up to the service provider or the cloud, maybe applying a NAT policy and forwarding the packet. So the point of showing you this is showing that our devices that we use today, the next generation firewalls, IPS, our mediated access through email appliances and WAFs, they are going to have uh, deep processing and knowledge of the application service and protocols that are being used. And it's, it's critical that they do. Here we see the web application firewall as part of our survey of protocol and aware devices, a very popular solution the web application firewall. Uh, these are also tools like from Cisco has the Cisco WSA web security appliance. They also have their cloud web services. Okay, Key characteristics of a WAP would include providing web proxy for HTTP and HTTPS, maybe a web cache engine. They do reputation filtering. You can do malware scanning. So for example, Cisco's WSA will use Sophos or WebRoot or McAfee, okay? Uh, there'll be some real-time malware scanning, typically involved with file disposition from a, a cloud uh, computing. Also URL filtering, very popular WAF solution. Application visibility and control, inspecting of encrypted traffic by encrypting and decrypting, okay? Also uh, reporting, rich reporting and tracking, maybe using L4TM for filtering outbound botnet traffic. It can also uh, be very helpful with external DLP services, data loss prevention, okay? And you can deploy these WAFs as a hardware appliance, or it can be a virtual appliance, for example, running inside of a VMware ESX. Another popular kind of inline application and protocol visibility solution is a DAM a database activity monitoring tool. This will actively monitor database transactions and database service activities. Uh, it operates continuously in real time. 
but it operates independently of the database management system. So for example, any logs that it creates, any metadata or reporting it creates is not stored in the original database management system. It's stored separately on its own kind of logging or through its own seam system. So you've got interception-based models that work kind of like an IPS. You've got memory-based models that are also going to look at, at data in memory. Okay, we call this data in use. So that could be used on an attached sensor to continuously pull system RAM. Maybe you're collecting SQL statements as they're being performed. They can also be log-based, where you're exfiltrating and analyzing information from the RDBMS transaction logs, okay? Now, realize that they can miss information, uh, maybe responses to database queries. And if you have you know, a, a, a lot of policies and a lot of traffic, the performance can actually degrade. Uh, some deployments will actually route traffic in line through the dam and then be processed by a, a, its own dedicated administrator. Uh, these are also very important tools to use for compliance, uh, for data loss prevention compliance, also for let's say HIPAA with PHI or uh, financial PII information. Next, we have the popular network IDS, intrusion detection systems, and network IPS, intrusion prevention systems. And I typically just use the term IPS. IPS, then I can differentiate between how it's deployed, okay? It's mode of operation. So if it's operating in kind of a monitor mode or a passive mode, that would be IDS. If it's in the inline mode, okay, then that would be IPS. So those lines have kind of blurred uh, traditionally, we would call IDS promiscuous mode. So it's kind of sniffing copies of traffic, maybe from a span port on a switch or a network tap. And then you have the inline mode. So we, you know, we would think of out of band versus in band. Okay. So uh, I just use the term IPS. It's deployed in a wide variety of modes. Even if you're going to deploy an IPS sensor in line, usually you're going to begin in monitor mode or passive mode so that you can optimize your deployment and then when you're ready, put it into inline mode, okay? Network IDS and IPS uh, have traditionally been signature-based and rule-based, okay? But we also see anomaly-based, which can be used to find, you know, active scanners, uh, worm scanners, for example, based on comparing those anomalies to a knowledge base. And we see anomaly-based network IPS now in more advanced SIEM systems, in more advanced cloud-based security systems, where the anomaly we're looking for is not just a scanning worm, but all different types of anomalies, okay? Next generation IPS, which I call snort on steroids, is very popular now. You know, a few years back, Cisco bought Sourcefire, uh, which used next generation snort and so we see that in a wide variety of tools. So nowadays, when you talk about network-based IPS, we're really thinking about next generation IPS, which is gonna provide us you know, policy-based advanced malware protection, heuristic and behavioral machine learning systems, correlation, integrating with the cloud and multiple vendors and multiple partners. Let's talk about tuning. Okay, and that means true positives, true negatives, false positives, and false negatives. You should already know what these are based on your security experience and knowledge, but just as a simple way to remember this, remember that positive means an action was taken and that negative means an action was not taken, okay? And that true means accurate or correct and that false means an error. Okay, so a true positive, basically it, the security control, let's say an IPS sensor acted as a consequence of malicious activity, okay? So it was positive, it acted, and it was true, it was accurate. So that means it's, it's normal and optimal operation. That's what we want, true positives. A true negative means the security control has not acted, negative, because there was no malicious activity. So it was accurate. This represents normal an optimal operation. So what do we want? True positives, true negatives. A false positive means a security control acted 
as a consequence of a non-malicious activity. It was benign, okay? But it was an error. And this is typically caused by too tight of controls, too tight proactive controls, which, you know, don't permit all legitimate traffic, or you've got too relaxed of reactive controls, okay? Too broad. So we want to reduce false positives. Then there's false negatives. False negatives mean the security control has not acted, okay, negative, even though there was malicious activity. It's an error. So this is an error generally caused by too relaxed proactive controls, okay, permitting more than just the minimal legitimate traffic or being too specific. So the challenge we have is to reduce false positives and to reduce false negatives. And why it's a challenge is there's an inverse relationship. Okay, the things that you will do to reduce false positives, which means allowing more events within a broader time frame, means you're going to increase the likelihood of false negatives. So it's kind of an ongoing game we have to play. Typically, we use tuning and optimization to reduce false positives, and we reduce false negatives by having rapid and regular updates from the cloud to keep the posture of our IPS up to date on a daily basis if possible. We have several ways we can deploy network IPS. We can use a SPAN port or an ER or R SPAN from a group or a matrix of switches to send traffic out that port to our sensor. We can also use a network tap, which is a device that looks kind of like a, a hub. Uh, Gigamon and Viavi NTAP are two common network tap companies. Uh, we can also place that sensor between VLANs on a multi-layer switch as a common deployment. Uh, the sensor could be a multi-port bridge or it could be a routing device on multiple interfaces. As we know, we can deploy it as a monitor only, which is passive, or it can be in line. And often, even if we're going to deploy it in line, we're going to start out in monitor mode or passive mode. Okay, And then once we're optimized, go to inline. And then finally, a very important concept is fail open or fail closed. If your IPS is considered mission critical, so for example, if we're deploying an IPS solution at Brio for one of our customers, okay, one of the things we have to decide and find out from that customer is if we're unable to, in, to inspect traffic in line, okay, and have the ability to aggressively drop traffic, if we lose that ability, if the sensor's down or if something fails, do we want to allow traffic to flow, okay? If we consider that IPS to be mission critical, and, and if it's not available or it's not doing its job and we don't want traffic to flow, that would be a fail-closed policy. So if the IPS is not functioning, no traffic flows. Fail open means if the IPS fails, we're still going to allow traffic to flow. We will be alerted by syslog or SDEE or some other mechanism to alert us that we've got a failure, but we're still gonna allow traffic to flow for the purposes of productivity. Another device that we need to be aware of is the wireless LAN controller. So as you can see in this diagram, we have an environment where we're going to take our access points that are deployed and we're gonna move away from a kind of a full functional thick AP or, you know, standalone AP to a more centrally organized and centrally managed thin AP, thin access point. So our thin access points are just receiving certain control and management frames and beacons and probes from our endpoints, but most of the traffic is being sent back to the wireless LAN controller. And by the way, if a device within the channel one area or cell, let's say a cell phone, wants to communicate with the device in the channel six cell, maybe a laptop or a cell phone, all the traffic is gonna go through the wireless LAN controller. In addition to supporting hundreds of access points, the wireless LAN controller can also look for rogue APs and soft APs. It can also provide visibility of all of our endpoints. It can help optimize as we analyze our wireless networks. So it provides a wide variety of services in addition to being the bridge between the dot .11 network, okay, the wireless network, and bridging back to the wired ethernet network. So that wireless LAN controller 
whether it's actually a module on a switch or a standalone controller or a virtual controller, is an important security device because it stands between our wireless network and our wired corporate LAN. And that's often, if you're doing penetration testing, a back door to get into and release an exploit or malware into the wired network coming through the wireless network, okay? And if you can find a back door through that LAN controller or that switch, then obviously you can do a lot of damage. So that's an, an important area to analyze from a security standpoint, okay? And they provide a very important role, not just for centralized management, but also for security as well. UTM stands for Unified Threat Management. And these are typically provided through security appliances that have a wide variety of features. For example, an adaptive security appliance, a Palo Alto next generation firewall, like a PA3000. Uh, like I said, the ASA, maybe a 5585X, uh, SonicWall, Juniper. These are all integrated appliances with multiple features that provide unified threat management. So they combine active and passive vulnerability scanning, firewall features, uh, intrusion prevention services, uh, antivirus, anti-malware all combined. And often these are virtualized appliances. You know, they're running in a VMware environment. So they are the unified threat management solution between users or clients and servers. For example, servers in the data center or the internet data center, as well as a unified threat solution between users and the internet and users on the internet accessing servers in a DMZ or a public access zone, or in some limited circumstances, uh, services inside our corporate LAN. Another popular solution is Network Emission Control, or Microsoft's NAP. This is being replaced, by the way, and this is on the exam. Okay, they want you to know about Network Emission Control, but, but this is being replaced by more strategic and high-end endpoint protection systems, typically that are cloud-based. But for the sake of the exam, let's take a look at this diagram and kind of the five steps that, that a NAP environment is going to go through. And what we're talking about here is making sure that your endpoints are policy compliant, okay? That they've either installed the antivirus or the anti-spam or the anti-malware or if they've already installed it, to make sure it's up to date, right? To make sure that they've got the latest update or the latest patch or fix. So step one, you've got that laptop up there and they're gonna, they're gonna request access. And by the way, this may also be in combination with an IEEE 802.1X PNAC environment as well. Actually, that would be a great marriage to have. But the laptop is requesting access. Well, then you'll have something like a radius server that is going to send the health state back to some type of policy server. So it's going to look at the, the browsers that are being running, the applications that are running, and it's going to send that information back to the NPS, let's say Microsoft's NPS, which is going to determine, is it compliant? Has it installed the Symantec antivirus? Has it updated its McAfee? Okay. Uh, if it is compliant, then it can continue and be authorized and get access to the corporate network and its resources. And the NPS is going to evaluate that information against its local health policies, which are, of course, stored in Active Directory in this environment. Let's go to step five, where it's not compliant, okay? In this case, they're going to be granted restricted access. They'll be redirected to a captive portal where through that captive portal, they will connect and they will update their health policy, like they'll patch their machine, they'll update or upgrade their antivirus. They'll do whatever they have to do based on the remediation servers. And then once that is accomplished, and it could take minutes or hours, then a COA process, a change of authorization process, will then reauthorize them as policy compliant and then give them access to their normal corporate network resources. And this may also involve placing them in different types of VLANs, restricted VLANs or temporary VLANs until they can get full corporate access to the Active Directory resources. Uh, so the original network admission control was really kind of a Cisco initiative. Cisco is moving away from that now to more cloud-based solutions, but 
Microsoft still has its network access protection. And that's what we've talked about here in this slide. Another important service that again is rapidly being updated and improved and in, in going into next generation is a combination of security information management and security event management. So when you combine SIM with SEM, you get SIEM systems, S-I-E-M, security information and event management systems. And these systems can take a wide variety of input. They can take syslog information, they can take application logs from your email servers, from your web servers, your SharePoint logs. They can take auditing logs, they can take firewall logs, maybe uh, hits, neg deny hits to your firewall rules, database logs, transaction logs, uh, routing, switching, proxies, a wide variety of devices that send logs. They can send all of this into an aggregated uh, log management. And in that aggregate log management uh, phase, there may be parsing and XML rules and a wide variety of other processing to those logs so they can be aggregated and then presented to the SIEM system in a unified way so that it can present the dashboards and the reports and the results across all these different types of logs and applications and platforms, okay? And so the SIEM system is valuable for reporting for compliance, PCI DSS, HIPAA, Sarbanes-Oxley, GLBA. It's also a very powerful event management and analysis tool, okay? So it gives us real-time monitoring. It can manage incidents and events. It can do a wide variety of responses, uh, email messages, alerts, alarms. Uh, so a wide variety of ways to uh, get access to administrators and power users. Also, you can have manual or automated log analysis. And these SIEM systems are really experts at taking and parsing NetFlow version 5 and NetFlow version 9 data, system logging information. But these next generation SIEM systems are becoming more cloud-based, more reliant on virtualization, and they're also integrating more modern data analysis uh, user behavior analysis, machine learning algorithms, other AI techniques, some that are proprietary, some that companies have patents on. Uh, some of these will be like a hybrid cloud solution where some of this information is going to be processed locally. Some of this will be sent up to the cloud, okay, to be processed in a disposition then returned back to the SIEM system or returned back to other devices, to the firewalls, to the IPS, to the proxies, to the gateways. So very important systems. And there's quite a few vendors out there and we'll see some of the vendors as we go on through uh, this course. The CASP exam also mentions load balancers, okay? These are actually kind of a reverse proxy tool that can distribute network or application traffic across a number of virtual or physical servers, okay? This is used to increase capacity, okay? So increase your concurrent users and to enhance application reliability. The goal is to improve the overall performance of applications. How do they do that? Well, they reduce the burden on servers that are managing and maintaining application and network sessions. Uh, they can perform application-specific tasks as well. Typically, load balancers operate at a layer four through seven. So there's really two categories. Like a layer four load balancer acts upon data found in the network and transport layer. So IP, uh, V4, V6, TCP, ICMP, FTP, UDP. A layer seven load balancer is often an application layer gateway load balancer that distributes requests based on data found in the application layer, like a web proxy or an HTTP load balancer. And you know, again, the majority of our traffic is web-based traffic. So it's very common to have an HTTP load balancer. A layer seven load balancer can even further distribute requests based on application specific data, like information in the HTTP headers, okay, the request headers, the response headers, information found in cookies, or even data within the application message itself, like a specific parameter. It can even use regular expressions to parse that out and load balance it, okay? So load balancers, uh, especially in data centers, 
uh, internet data centers are very powerful tools. A couple of other inline devices that you might see in your organization is a HAPE device or an INE. These are traditionally kind of inline encryption, decryption, specialized appliance. So a HAPE is a high assurance internet protocol encryptor and an INE is an inline network encryptor. So the HAPE is an IP encryption device that looks at the destination IP address of a packet. It has an internal security association database, and then it chooses the proper encrypted tunnel or the proper cryptographic primitive or the appropriate uh, encapsulation methodology based on the IP address. Uh, for a new communication, the HAPE would use its internal security policy database, the SPD, to then set up a new tunnel using the right algorithms and using the right suites and settings. For example, choosing the proper TLS 1.2 suites, okay? Uh, now, HAPEs don't support routing protocols. So they do not participate in dynamic routing with like RIP version two or OSPF. So you have to program them with static routes for north-south traffic, upstream and downstream, okay? They can't adjust to a changing network topology. And so those are HAPE devices. We also have INEs, which are kind of inline uh, encryptors and decryptors. And if you wanna know more about these types of devices, do a web safari up to www.viasat.com. Next, we have the hardware security module, also a device that's application and protocol aware, but it's more of a dedicated standards compliant cryptographic appliance that's designed to protect sensitive data in transit, in use, and at rest using physical security measures, okay? Like a physical box that's very difficult to break into. It also uses logical security controls and strong encryption. You can also see HSMs in the form of micro SD HSMs, which are smaller, more compact, integrated components. Either way, the, the core functionality of an HSM is centered around encryption, okay? So obviously taking sensitive data and scrambling it into ciphertext, right? So what we use HSMs for is methods to ensure confidentiality and origin authentication by storing secret keys, session keys, HMAC keys in these HSM devices, these appliances. A couple of popular ones are SafeNet, Jamalto HSM, and Thales Enshield Edge. So for example, your router or your adaptive security appliance, or for example, in this scenario, maybe we have a Palo Alto next generation firewall that can store all the private keys, the RSA private keys or elliptic curve DSA private keys, session keys, HMAC keys. This key management can be done by this connected HSM appliance. And by the way, the connection between the firewall the NG firewall, and let's say the Thales and Shield Edge, that's obviously gonna be a highly protected TLS 1.2 connection to get those keys to go back and forth with those uh, with that safe encryption and decryption mechanism. So very key solution to implement nowadays because of the uh, greater usage of certificate services, PKI, uh, TLS, which uses a combination of symmetric and asymmetric keys, and also to support your IPsec, Ike version two, and Sweep E cryptography environment as well, hardware security modules, HSMs.